What do a 10-year-old grilled cheese sandwich sold for $28,000, babies, and nearly forgotten relatives all have in common with each other? Well, each of these has something to do with a very special area in our brain called the fusiform gyrus. The fusiform gyrus is located in your temporal and occipital lobes, specifically spanning the basal surface of your temporal and occipital cortex. So if we looked at the bottom surface of your brain, we'd find the fusiform gyrus right here. The location of the fusiform gyrus is pretty important when we think about its primary function of facial recognition. The temporal lobe deals with memory acquisition and comprehension in general, while the occipital lobe primarily allows us to see. Face recognition is sort of a combination of both memory and comprehension, as well as using visual cues. So the location of the fusiform gyrus along the temporal and occipital lobes is intrinsically tied to its function in facial recognition. But how did we even discover the fusiform gyrus? Before the late 1990s, there wasn't enough scientific evidence to suggest there was a different part of the brain for perceiving objects from perceiving faces. It wasn't until a study in 1997 was published that the notion of a specific region for facial recognition was solidified. Depending on what sort of stimuli you experience, different parts of your brain will be activated. This type of activity can be measured with a functional MRI, in which activated regions will light up in response to a stimulus. In 1997, the first peer-reviewed paper supporting the idea of a face-specific processing in the brain showed that when human subjects were shown faces, the area we now know as the fusiform gyrus lit up. More specifically, a tiny area the size of a blueberry within the fusiform gyrus displayed a disproportionate amount of activity, with about 97% of the area lighting up when participants viewed faces, but not when they viewed other things like houses, hands, or cars. And even more interesting, in most patients, this activity was concentrated on the right side of the brain. This blueberry-sized region is aptly named the fusiform face area. In a way, humans were made to see faces, not just in people, but even in random stimuli. Have you ever seen a face in a cup of coffee or a stain or a car? Then you've experienced the phenomenon called pareidolia, which is directly connected to the fusiform gyrus's function. And it makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint that recognizing faces come so naturally to humans. Carl Sagan, the notable astronomer, once theorized, those infants who a million years ago were unable to recognize a face smiled back less, were less likely to win the hearts of their parents and less likely to prosper. So if we understand Sagan's quote correctly, Infants with a particularly active fusiform gyrus would survive and grow up to pass on their genes, and consequently their active fusiform gyrus, to future offspring. And in the adult stage, the fusiform gyrus and pareidolia continued to be useful. If our ancient predecessors assumed they saw a face even when there wasn't one, it could protect them from potential danger in the form of, say, predators. But in today's day and age, we're not really using our fusiform gyrus to defend ourselves from predators. Remember that grilled cheese sandwich and how I said it was also related to the fusiform gyrus? Well, the reason it was sold for so much money was because people saw an image of the Virgin Mary in the brown spots of the sandwich. It just goes to show that humans can find faces in pretty much anything because of our fusiform gyrus. However, there's still so much to learn about the fusiform face area. More studies are being done. For instance, some showing how even blind individuals utilize their fusiform gyrus, thus challenging the idea that visual perception is needed for facial recognition. With the purpose so integral to humans' evolutionary journey and how we function with other people, it's hard to imagine what we do without our fusiform gyrus. And if you ever manage to sell a sandwich with a face in it for an insane amount of money, you know what part of your brain to thank.